Hello, it's Peter Wright and Kathleen Beauvais with another episode of The Yacking Show. This is a show where we, we bring you expert guests to help you have a better, healthier and happier and we hope more purposeful life. So today will be no exception. Very interesting guest coming up, but it's not my job to introduce her because Kathleen does that job so much better than I do. So first, let's welcome co-host Kathleen. Hi, Kathleen. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing great, Peter. Thank you so much. And thank you all so very much for tuning in to our show. We so appreciate having you. And as Peter mentioned, we do have another special guest with us today. We are very excited to welcome Jill Sitnick to the show today. Hello, Jill. How are you? Hi, Hi. Jill. Hi, good morning. I have to tell you, I'm just so excited to be on this podcast. I love the name of it. Yeah. Oh, it. <laughs> good. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Now, um, Jill is a uh, a PTSD survivor and now helps people demystify psychedelic assisted psychotherapy by sharing strategies that can lead to their healing. And today she's here to yak with us about her story and what has motivated her to help other people. So let's just dive right in, Jill. Can you explain how you were first introduced to psychedelics to help you work through your childhood trauma? trauma? And um, were you afraid to try this method? <laughs> I'll answer the second question first. Yes, I was. Okay. Uh, I was a child of the eighties. I have the egg in the frying pan uh, commercial that drugs do this horrible stuff to your brain. So the easy answer is yes. In the very beginning, before I understood anything, the very, very short story is that I lost my partner of over 20 years. Mm. When I lost Carl, I went into therapy to help me with the grief. Right. A year and a half after he passed, when my widow's fog was starting to fade away, I had a work email that sent me into this mental spiral PTSD attack that I was 100% sure that within a month I was going to be poor. I was going to lose my house, lose my job. I mean, really just completely over the top. And after a couple of months of obviously the world not caving in, but my body and mind still in this, in this, like, I need to run away. Something awful is going to happen. I went back to my therapist after several months of talk therapy and starting to understand my childhood, because we had never talked about that stuff. I had originally gone to her to deal with grief. She diagnosed mm -hmm. me, she diagnosed me with PTSD. I had to go read the book. The body keeps the score. I had homework. She gave me homework. And uh, I realized that my childhood was evidencing itself through my physical reactions. Mm. She told me that she was becoming a psychedelic assisted psychotherapist. She was in a program. And that if I chose to work with this healing modality, I would have her with me and her mentor, who was a medical doctor at the time. And I immediately, I said, no, to go to your second question. I was like, no drugs, no, but I went to go look at the research on maps.org, the multidisciplinary association for psychedelic studies, mm -hmm. two thirds of the people in their clinical trials did not have PTSD symptoms after three sessions. Wow. wow. That's huge. And, and I was, I was at the end of my rope. I basically said yes, because I was at this point months in talk therapy wasn't working and I didn't know, I didn't, I didn't have any other choice. So that's kind of my story in a, in a little bit of a nutshell. Right. Wow. Yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting. So one of the things that you use, I, I've tried, got to try and get my tongue around all these words beginning with P, but one of the, uh, ingredients or, or <clears throat> drugs for want of a better term you use is MDMA. So can, Jill, can you tell us our audience, what is MDMA and how does it help PTSD? Oh my gosh. So MDMA is a synthetic. It was, uh, it was extracted and developed in the early 1900s. People didn't really understand how it could benefit. You know, it was just one of those lab created things with existing chemicals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, throughout the 1900s, uh, people started to use it and people started to understand there was some clinical benefit to the MDMA calming down the trauma response and allowing people who have really scary, frightening, terrifying things happen that caused trauma, that the MDMA calms the body down. And you'll see me put my hands on my shoulder a lot because I think I lived my life with like my shoulders to my ears. Mm -hmm. 
1986, due to all the drug war drama, which we won't talk about right here, but in the States, drug war drama, uh, it was reclassified. And so therefore it became kind of a street drug. And so now you mm -hmm. hear MDMA as labeled as like ecstasy or uh, Molly. Okay. Mm -hmm. I just want to be super clear with folks that if you are getting ecstasy or Molly from, you know, your neighborhood person, please make sure to test it because usually the street drugs have something else mixed into it. Mm -hmm. For me, my uh, therapy was what I call medical grade MDMA. I knew for a fact that that's what the substance was. And fundamentally, it really does. It calms the panic and trauma response and allows the patient to talk about and think about things that are terrifying. So okay. Okay. I did. I get both. I got both sides. Yeah, you did. You did very well. Is it? Okay. Uh, I, I'm a child of a couple of eras before you. So in my late teenage, early adult years, LSD was the big thing, right? Not that I ever tried it. I came from a very conservative background, as you'll hear from some other things I'll ask you later on. But okay. LSD was LSD was in the news. So is, is there a relationship between LSD and MDMA? Uh, I don't know. I've actually have not uh, used LSD therapeutically or recreationally. Uh, I do believe, though, I was just on the, the U.S.'s clinical site. Look at me. You're making me think now of statistics. <laughs> there are clinical trials going on with LSD. I just am not an expert in that field. I do not believe I've seen anything specifically around how LSD can help PTSD. Right now, okay. right now MDMA is really the front runner. Okay, because LSD was a synthetic drug as well, was it not? Created in a laboratory? Lysergic uh, yes. something? Yes. Right. Okay, no, I just wondered if there was a connection. Okay, well, back to Kathleen. <laughs> so is there a risk of becoming addicted to these drugs? Yeah, so I think it's really important that anybody can become addicted to anything. Right. Me, stupid mm -hmm. thing on my phone, right? I've got this game, I got to delete it. So with that said, MDMA in and of itself, especially in a therapeutic session, there's no, there's no opportunity to become addicted to it. I had to go to a place, a, a journey room, a journey setting with my doctor and my therapist. I had two capsules. I was then after my journey day and then months at home working talk therapy with my therapist. I then went in for a second journey let me see that first journey was September. My second journey was December. Mm -hmm. Like this isn't the kind of drug that you crave. It's a drug mm -hmm. that you enjoy. So you'll hear people going to parties and raves and maybe, you know, a couple of times a month or once every so-and-so, but you're not hearing. It's not like some of those other drugs out there where you take it once and you're addicted. Right. It's nothing else. Um, and there's also a significant, unless you're taking some antioxidants, there's a little bit of a downtime with MDMA that doesn't feel great because uh, you released all this serotonin to feel good during the actual mm -hmm. therapy mm -hmm. experience. And so your brain has to replenish those chemicals. Um, so I'm not here. So I just want to disclaim, I'm sure in some way, shape or form, someone could get addicted to anything. MDMA right. inherently is not a <laughs> substance that gets people um, addicted. Right. And so, okay. so as you said, the, the whole point of these drugs is to help you to calm your body down because oftentimes in, in psychotherapy or any kind of counseling, you're talking, you're bringing up the trauma again, you're reliving the trauma by just talking about it. And a lot of times people just don't want to do that, but the drugs help to calm your body is what you're trying to say. And to the point where that that um, it takes the edge off, basically. It doesn't make you feel that intense um, trauma and you're yeah. able to talk it out. Is that is that how it works? Uh, I'm going to throw a phrase at you. Okay. The issue is in the tissues. Okay. Which is a ridiculous okay. phrase. But let, let's have your audience members think about doing something that makes them super nervous. For most people, it's getting up to talk in front of a group, public speaking. Mm -hmm. I personally love it. I can't get enough of it. But most people hate that feeling. Mm 
Right. And most people can admit that if they're going to get up to public speak, their their palms might sweat, their shoulders might be tight, their stomach might be upset, they might have a little head buzzing, like however they experience nervousness. Right. Imagine those physical symptoms of nervousness being calmed. How much more enjoyable would that public speaking event mm-hmm. be? True. So that's kind of a real low, not low, That that's kind of a, a way to think about how MDMA, and remember when I'm talking, I mean, psilocybin or magic mushrooms kind of works a little bit differently. MDMA specifically really calms down the body. So people who like me, I was marinated in my father, my father beat me mentally, physically abused me. My mother attempted suicide multiple times. She was clinically depressed her entire life. So for me, being kind of marinated in fear and uncertainty, the MDMA calmed the the tissues so I could deal with the issue. Okay. And that's really a lot of the barrier. Right. But then mm. out of curiosity, once the effects of that calming effect wears off, what what are you left with? How, how do you- What are you left with? Hoping? So here's where uh, the healing part is fascinating because most people, myself included, thought that all of the healing would happen during the MDMA session. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's, it can. In my instance, what was fascinating was that my healing started to happen right after the session. So I woke up out of that first MDMA session with my guide and my doctor. And I thought it was, I thought five hours was 45 minutes. I didn't really remember anything. And I remember I started to cry because I was like, I wasted everybody's time. This didn't work. I don't feel great. (laughs) I'm in the car. My boyfriend came to pick me up. I'm in the car and I'm going through this shame spiral of, I'm not good enough. I wasted everybody's time. I didn't do a good job. I'm such an inconvenience. Nobody likes me. I mean, I went through this whole shame spiral and suddenly, and I'm looking out the window because I'm crying and three childhood memories came up. You see, after my mom shot herself, Mm -hmm. she needed to recuperate. And my father, like they could not take care of a five-year-old at that point. And their marriage was disintegrating. Like lots of stuff was happening. I didn't understand any of that. All I knew from five to eight years old was that I got shuffled around to different relatives. There was never any money. I didn't really see my parents that much. I was an inconvenience, like the extra cot in the room or Mm. the person in the middle of the school year that had to get taken out and gone to another. I don't even know how many people I lived with during that time period. I had three of those memories just kind of flip. You know how when you're in the shower and like ideas just come or you're taking a walk and ideas just come. Mm -hmm. That's how these memories floated into my focus. And I looked at them from the adult perspective and I'm like, wait a minute. I was not an inconvenience. I was a kid. My parents didn't have the capability to take care of me. And that reframing, that's how you heal trauma. Mm -hmm. And so that cycle continued to happen. Different memories would come. I would look at them through my, well, the time I was in my late forties, I would look at them through that perspective and realize I was not at fault. The universe wasn't against me. I just happened to have parents that weren't emotionally and economically equipped to take care of me. Right. Right. Mm, Interesting. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So apart from, Jill, apart from addiction, are there any other long-term side effects or consequences of these um, psychedelic psychotherapy type treatments? Uh, I don't know about long-term. I would say with, with MD, remember we're talking MDMA. Sure. I focus on MDMA. I don't, I don't focus on psilocybin just yet. Um, I think what's super important, I wouldn't, I think you're looking at, hey, is there any documented health issue with going mm. through? this therapy. I haven't seen anything. I certainly don't feel any sort of negative health issues. Uh, As a matter of fact, just last October, I had some horrible flashbacks to when my partner passed away. First thing I did was call the friend and said, would you sit with me? I need an MDMA journey because my, my body is literally feeling like the night that he died. Mm -hmm. And and that's, that was years after I had done another journey. So Mm -hmm. I don't see any sort of if you're properly screened that you don't have schizophrenia, 
you don't have a phobia. Mm -hmm. MDMA is a stimulant that you don't have a problem with your heart. If you are properly screened and monitored the way you would be with any other medical procedure, I haven't had, you don't hear stories of like health issues afterward. If you're properly okay. screened and if you're in a therapeutic environment, you can go on okay. Reddit, you can read read weird stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> People did some weird stuff, but therapeutically, no. Okay. 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 And and the pure, sorry, the, the, the amount you take, you said a couple of capsules. So mm -hmm. if you're only taking a couple of capsules of anything every couple of months, there's not unless that's really deadly poison it's not going to do you a lot of harm is it it's not like taking a pound of something every day or anything like that <laughs> it's way less <laughs> way less dangerous than the amount of sugar i try to get out of my diet yeah. right <laughs> right well tell us about your book uh, which yes. is titled rescuing jill and how people can purchase it maybe you can hold it up for the audience to take a look at it oh this is this is my copy this is what i i i got my little post it note in there nice so when I went through the therapy, you have to understand too, my mother was clinically depressed her entire life and I had zero faith in therapy. When I went for my grief work, honestly, I just went because I wanted some, I wanted to talk about my grief and, you know, it gets too much for your friends. Mm -hmm. So I didn't really have a lot of faith in therapy. When I finished my third journey, uh, we had made some tremendous breakthroughs through at my third journey. And I basically said to my therapist and my guide, I need to share this. I have a strong voice. I was an English teacher. I'm, I'm a corporate girl. I was in technology. Like I need to let people know that this therapy works because people like me are only going to listen to people like me. Like I was not going to listen to somebody with all the stereotypical psychedelic appearances. You know, mm -hmm. I wouldn't, mm -hmm. somebody like, I, I was a corporate girl. I was not going to listen to that. And so that's when I decided to write the book because the entire time I had journaled. And so the book is my year long journey. As I went through this healing, mm -hmm. uh, people who've experienced child abuse, they get the book. People who have not experienced child abuse are kind of like, eh, you took a long time explaining. <laughs> But that's the way the therapy worked. The therapy was not a turnkey. It took a lot of work. It took a lot of thinking. It took a lot of journaling. So that's where that came from. And then uh, last year I wrote a workbook because I saw people going on retreats and not understanding at all how to use psychedelics therapeutically. So I wrote a workbook that mirrors what me and my doctor did. Uh, everything's up on thejourneysage.com. Okay. And my YouTube channel is pure education for folks. I wanted to create the content that I wish had been around when I was going through the therapy. Right. To answer a lot of the questions you had, what's it like? How does it feel? Uh, what was the process? And so that's all up on the YouTube channel for folks. Okay, great. Okay, very good. Uh, what's your YouTube channel called? Uh, the Journey Sage. The Journey? The Journey Sage. I'm the educator about the journey. Oh, okay. See? Good. See? Well, See? Mm -hmm. for our audio listeners, we will put those links in the description for you. So here's here's one from me. Now I come, as I mentioned earlier, I come from a really conservative British type background, but I lived in Africa for most of my life, totally against any form of drugs. Um, I did smoke cigarettes for a while because in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, everybody did, right? And uh, but I stopped that hardly ever touch alcohol so even like a good friend of mine who shall remain nameless went off and did the ayahuasca retreat in south america and that scares the hell out of me but i'll let her speak about that <laughs> and um I, I anything to do with anything that alters the mind the state of the mind just makes me really really nervous right so and I don't think I'm alone in that and maybe it's a generational thing but as i said earlier my generation was also the ones that started the hippie movement and the hippie drugs so it's a bit of a mix and match where am i going with this so is it becoming more acceptable for people to consider and we've had a couple of other people on the show who've been and done the ayahuasca and and more and all sorts of really weird psychedelic stuff and they said they've come out of it a lot better than they went into it um is it becoming more access acceptable that's my question to you it is peter it's not weird it's not weird. Yeah. 
No, it really is. I actually just had this conversation with someone I met. Um, it, it's funny. People reach out to me all the time on LinkedIn, of all places, with lots of questions. And um, I, so I'm Generation X. I feel like the generations, uh, the younger generations are way more open because I don't right. think we got the egg in the frying pan commercials the way that I did right. in the 80s. <laughs> And here's the thing, in the US, it's going to be MDMA for PTSD is on track to be FDA approved in August. Okay. It'll be rescheduled from our drug agency in like three months. So like by 2025, the same way that like in Australia, they have MDMA for PTSD treatment. Mm -hmm. In the US by 2025, we might have clinics that uh, allow for this treatment to happen. So just think of like, think of like the last medication that you were like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that actually does that. That's kind of how this is going to be. People are going to be like, oh my gosh, this actually can help me heal something. Um, mm -hmm. You're just fighting decades of decades of media coverage that was all negative because that's the information they were getting. Right. And stigma. Right? That's yeah. But so if it, just just pursue this one a little bit. If it's not FDA approved now, mm -hmm. how ca how can it be administered? How how do people get the treatment? There is a very strong underground. I'm not. I'm completely transparent that my therapy happened underground. I was not okay. part of clinical trials. And um, what's kind of happening now is that as we get closer in the U.S. to FDA approval, you're seeing a lot of the underground people starting to kind of peek their heads up jump into training programs. I'm in a psychedelic assisted coaching program that I start in July. So I think you know, it's gonna be a moving target when it first gets started. We have to kind of mm -hmm. crawl before we can walk. Right. But in five years, I think we're, unless something really horrendous happens, I think we're going to have a good number of healing modalities that we don't have now. That's my guess. Okay. Mm. Okay. Good. And, and out of curiosity, Jill, have you tried any other forms of treatment? And how, like, how many? And none of them worked for you. Not like this. Is that of right? treatment for, for, for PTSD? Right. Well, so um, I would say, yeah, no. Hmm. I was on Wellbutrin about a year after Carl passed. the The second year of grief, I think, is actually way worse than the first year in my opinion, because the second year is when you really realize they're not coming back. Right. And so I did go on Wellbutrin for depression. Yeah. I had to get off of Wellbutrin for my PTSD, but there was, there's really no, other than talk therapy, there's really no specific treatment in the US that is known to work for PTSD. That's why in 2017, our FDA over here in the States made MDMA therapy breakthrough therapy designation, which means it moves a little bit faster to drug development. And it means that they also, okay. that the FDA has realized there's no existing therapy that does as well as what they saw in those clinical trials. Okay. Wow. Okay. That is interesting. So here's one, here's one for you, Jill. Um, why do some, and I'm not knocking what happened to you. I'm not trying to belittle your experience in the slightest. I, I think okay. it's horrendous. I'm ready. I'm ready. So I'm, ready. I'm, no, I'm giving you an observation that I, I in my personal life in Africa, went through some, some bad parts. You know, um, family members murdered by terrorists, uh, kicked off our farm because we're white farmers in Zimbabwe, death threats, um, thrown in a police cell. Uh, and I did 10 years in the military fighting a terrorist war. Not that I saw a lot of action myself, saw a little, not anywhere near as much as others, had good friends killed. So I went through all that, and and I thought I came out of it pretty well. I, and other people might say, yes, of course, you're nuts, but uh, PTSD in my generation was never mentioned. You know, I, we heard stories of shell shock in World War II, and some guys did go nuts coming back from World War II. We weren't involved in Vietnam, but we had our own little war. And I don't recall anyone actually going nuts during that war. During the farm takeovers, there was a couple of farmers who were were really badly treated, beaten within an inch of their lives, and and 
carted in a police vehicle with one of another dead farmer with them. So one, two of those guys have never really got back to normal. And that's about the only case that I know exactly. So so it's a long observation, a long rambling story, and I'm not making out that I'm a hero. I'm not. But why does do some people some people get affected by TSD and others go through horrific life, parts of life and they come out relatively normal? What is it? Empathetic witness. It's the ability to process really strong emotions. If uh, the emotion that you have when something happens, anger, fear, in my instance, and from your stories, I have to assume some anger and some fear. Mainly anger. Sure. If you can't express though if you can't express and process those emotions at some point with an empathetic witness and i say empathetic witness somebody to hold you somebody to listen to you offer some perspective uh you tend to retain that emotion mm -hmm. and if that emotion is strong enough it can become trauma and make your body say i know that this activity is dangerous and if Jill, as an adult, comes in any way, shape, or form towards something like that activity, as a body, I'm going to give her signals to stop her from doing that and keep her safe. Okay. So when I got that email, I, my, I had been thrown out of my parents' homes two times, housing insecurity, food insecurity. So when I got this relatively benign email about, it was from work, it was like I needed to get some certifications, I panicked. I went back to, oh my gosh, something has happened outside of my control, which is going to affect me. And my, my fear from being thrown out when I was a kid was evidencing itself by my body freaking out saying, there's danger, danger, do something, okay. do something. Okay. If I had had people back in the day, an empathetic witness to help me discharge that fear, but I didn't, my relatives... So they had their niece with them or they had their second cousin with them. Like they they didn't have an understanding and neither did I that this was really a traumatic experience for a kid. Um, it basically comes down to how stable you are with emotional connections to people going in, what the actual trauma was, and if you were able to process those emotions at the time. So there's lots of variables. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if I can just pursue that one, we do have a couple of minutes. So in my case, in the the early part of that was in the military, there was a lot of us in the same boat together, right? And we would talk about what we were going through and how we felt and that sort of thing. Then 20, 30 years later, when the farm invasion started in 2000, there were 5,000 farmers in the same boat. It, it happened over three years, but we had neighbors, friends, uh, family in some cases that we could talk about it. W would that have made a difference and helped us get through this? Yeah. Okay. It's one of the reasons okay. why when you have veterans that are so close to each other because they Absolutely. went through that experience together. Absolutely. I will also say though, in the, in the States, there's a statistic. It seems to go around 17 to 20 veterans a day attempt suicide in the U S. Wow. Like a lot of this MDMA work, our Veterans Association is really paying a lot of attention. There are um, sure. VET, there's a VETS organization. I think I just butchered their name. But like we know in the US, PTSD for veterans is a major issue, mm -hmm. even though there's a stigma around service men and women kind of talking about it. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm. I can't wait really until the VA offers this kind of treatment. Um, and I do think, I mean, we have 17 to 20 people a day attempting suicide. Oh, that's that terrible. Probably beats. They're not getting, the people around them probably don't even know that there's an issue because you can right. function. You're just really dysregulated. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right. Mm -hmm. Wow. Like that, that's terrifying to think that many people are... Yeah. Trying to commit suicide. Oh, no. and and they're not young. I mean, Vietnam veterans of my generation, right? No. Most of them are over. I think all of them are over sixty now, aren't they? Oh, yeah. I would yeah, say. Yeah, I don't. I don't know the age group of the of the statistic. And again, the statistic changes depending on sure. which web go to. But I mean, I think it's pretty safe to say it's an alarming issue, no matter what. Oh yeah, for sure. Absolutely.
Wow. Well, Sorry, Kathleen. I was monopolizing Jill's attention that's there. All so. right. I know, but we are running uh, short on time, Peter, but I know you have your burning question that you want to ask. So you go ahead. Oh, my <laughs> burning <one>? question. My <laughs> burning. Uh, what do you mean another one? That was only a mild one. Um, <laughs> my, we could go on on that PTSD thing, but I, we're running out of time. So let me ask you my burning question. This is one we ask all our health experts, all people who've had an interesting journey through life. So Jill, yeah. A lot of people are very negative and they see doom and gloom. You know, we've got the war in the Middle East. We've got the Ukraine thing. We've got, um, we've just come out of this whole lockdown nonsense. We've got encampments on universities. We've got inflation. I don't want to go on and on. Kathleen and I are not negative. I've been through enough in my life to say life is good and I want to live the most of it. But a lot of people don't see a happy future. So what's one thing you could give our audience that they could think about, start doing, What's one bit of advice you'd give them to start living a happier, more purposeful life from tomorrow? One thing. Uh, take a look at the stories that you're telling yourself. Mm. It took me mm -hmm. a long time to understand that the stories I was telling myself were stories I made up nine out of 10 times. Right. right. If you take a belief, I've, I've now gotten to the point, I would say within the last six months, uh, specifically being very, very purposeful. If a thought comes in, especially a negative thought, and I, I'll look at it and I'll say, is this a story? Why am I telling this story? Is there maybe another story? Where did this story come from? And I think if we start to separate our thoughts a little bit by looking at them and saying, hey, where did you come from? What's the story here? Is there another story? Oh, my hair doesn't look great today. Well, that's a story. What could another story be? Oh my gosh, my hair looks pretty darn good for it being 100% humidity, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, my easiest advice for folks, especially when I'm coaching is, okay, that's a really great story. What could another story be? What would somebody else looking at that story say? Mm -hmm. That's kind of my advice uh, on a personal level. Take a look at the stories because the stories we tell each ourselves are usually pretty negative. <laughs> Right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. No, that's that that is really, really good advice. That's Absolutely. excellent advice. Yeah. Well, so yeah. before I hand back to Kathleen yep. to have the final word, which she always does, by the way. Um <laughs> sure. yes. You know, well, and I've got to be careful because <laughs> it's one against two here. Um just a quick quick message for our audience. We've had another brilliant guest on the show today. So to make sure you don't miss out on all the very exciting guests we've got coming up over the next few months, hop onto our website, theyackingshow.com, uh, hit the purple button on the top or the bottom of the front page and sign up for our newsletter. We only send you one email a week and we just tell you who's on this week, who's coming next week and perhaps the week or two after that and a health tip. That's it. And then you won't miss out on our guests. So Jill, once again, thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks to you, our audience, for listening and back to Kathleen for her final word. Well, Jill, before we go, please let us know, how do people contact you? Uh, Jill at thejourneysage.com okay. or head over to my website. I've got a nice Calendly link. People can chat and ask all the embarrassing questions that they don't want to write out an email. And once again, the uh, name of that website? thejourneysage.com thejourneysage.com perfect thank you so much Jill it was a pleasure having you on the show today and thank you all, all once again for tuning into our show if anyone is interested in being a guest on our show please visit us at theyackingshow.com all you need to do is click on the contact tab where you will find a short application form and we'd love to hear from you so until next time take care everyone bye 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 bye